Hello, this is Vin Banj from Taylor Wessing. Welcome to our webinar today. Today's webinar is part of our regular webinar program where we bring you our expertise and views on topical data protection and GDPR issues. Our regular attendees will be very familiar with our previous topics, which have been included looking at challenges such as GDPR and the numerous elements that fall under that particular topic, looking at issues such as direct marketing and ad tech, and also more recently, as we've looked at more internationally focused and themed sessions, we looked at the SHREMS 2 decision not so long ago. Now, recordings of those webinars are available if you miss them and you still wish to engage with us on those particular topics. In fact, there are some 30 plus webinars to access in our virtual data protection learning bank. Today, we're going to be looking at the topic of AADC, the age appropriate design code. Now, it's a topic that's been in the making for probably well over a year now, but we're going to have a look at this very specifically today. Now, I can see that we have some new attendees today. So just very briefly for those of you who are new to this webinar series, Hello Essing is a leading international law firm. We act for a range of leading clients in local and international markets, providing a full service law firm offering. And we do so from our office footprint, which spans across Northern, Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East, across Asia, and also into the United States. And we've listed more details about the firm later in the slide deck for your reference. As you could see from the agenda slide, um, and in a moment I will introduce today's presenters for you, we're going to be looking at the topic of AADC, but look at this from the context of assessing what the AADC is, where it fits into the scheme of GDPR, the scheme of data protection, obligations, and rights. We're also then going to be looking at what it means to address the obligations and the requirements of the AADC and how to update that into your own programs. And also looking at the fundamental issue of design and default, and in particular, legal design, which is a very important part of compliance and will be a key aspect of getting that right, certainly with regard to issues such as transparency. And we'll see more about those particular issues. As usual, we're also going to have some polling questions to gauge your views. And as always, the results of those will follow moments after the poll closes for each question and will be displayed in aggregate without any particular attribution to you individually. So please do click and tap away so we can help you understand from your fellow attendees what your views are on those particular questions. In terms of today's presenters, as I said, my name is Vin Banj. I'm head of the data protection practice, and I'm also delighted to be introducing my colleagues today. So first of all, I'd introduce you to Joe Joyce, who's a senior member of the London-based team, very experienced in all aspects of data protection and information rights. And also to introduce you to Tamara mckay Temesi, who is a member of the London-based data team as well, and also takes a lead role in the development of our legal design themes and our innovation programs. So some of those topics, as I mentioned on the agenda, Tamara is going to be giving us an, a, an insightful view of what that means in the context of children's data and the age appropriate design code. Now we're all going to be presenting today. So let's get started on the core topic, which is where I will kick off. To try and understand what does this mean, and also to help you work out where you think you are and maybe where your fellow attendees are, I wanted to start just by a snapshot of your thoughts on the following polling question. So I'd, I'd love to have your views on the following polling question then. Do you think the AADC will apply to your business? And in the context of the three answers, yes, you think it's highly likely to apply. Middle answer, as always, is you're just not sure, and that's perhaps why you're here. Or you think there's a low chance that it applies, but you are here, and that's perhaps because you're just keen to know more uh, about the topic and validate whether or not there really is a low chance that it applies. So be very interested to see your thoughts on, on that in terms of whether it's highly likely to apply, not sure do you think there's a low chance of it applying. And interesting, so some of you are obviously here because you think there is a 
very high chance, and 70% of you think it's highly likely to apply. Not too much difference between the other two categories. Some of you not sure on that, some 12.5% and just a nudge more at 15 believe that there is a low chance that you want to understand more. So it's 30% of you that fall into the other category. So let's see what we can do to in help you understand um, how this will apply to you. Uh, also help you understand more if you're not sure. And also just help you understand more about this if you fall into the low chance category, but actually you're here to try and validate that and understand that a little bit further. And in addition to this webinar, we also have quite a bit of content that we have produced, some articles, some thought leadership, um, and we've been building on that for the last year or so as the AADC code has been building in itself. So that's available on the TeleOS in Global Data Hub, so feel free to access that. Uh, at your own convenience. And towards the end of the slides, you'll see more references to where you can access that. That's on the Global Data Hub. So where does this sit? Where does the AADC fit into the grand scheme of things? Now, some of this might look as if I'm stating the obvious. We have had the previous package of data protection laws that go back to the 1990s. And before that, into the early 80s, around previous data protection law. What we now have is moving across to the current position where under the GDPR era and related laws, in particular the Data Protection Act 2018, um, there are requirements for the ICO to present certain codes of practice. One of those is on uh, data sharing, and we've looked at that topic already in a previous session. But also another one of those topics is to provide a code in relation to children's data, which is why we often see the AADC referred to as GDPR for kids sometimes. So here we have the AADC, the code is now here, and its governance and its enforcement will flow under the same package of laws that provide us with the Data Protection Act 2018, in other words, the UK GDPR. So it's not to be taken lightly, and there are some interesting observations. And certainly, if you were to look at the ICO's statements when they released the AADC uh, in, in, in recent days, uh, I think there's one statement that jumps out in particular when the Information Commissioner, this was Denham, says that a generation from now, we will all be astonished that there was ever a time when there wasn't specific regulation to protect kids online. It will be as normal as putting on a seatbelt. This code makes clear that kids are not like adults online and their data needs greater protections. We want children to be online, learning and playing and experiencing the world, but with the right protections in place. We do understand that companies, particularly small businesses, will need support to comply with the code. And that's why we've taken the decision to give businesses a year to prepare and why we're offering help and support. I think that's an interesting quote that we've seen from the ICO. Uh, one, because it talks about the sheer impact of what this code is trying to do and the fundamental change that this code brings to a large degree in its focus, but also around the, the implementation period and why that's been provided. Now, the ICO talks and mentions, quote, particularly small businesses, unquote. But I think, and as you'll see further from our presentation today, and when you hear more about the detail and the standards, and particularly about how implication, sorry, how implementation may manifest itself, we think many businesses will need 12 months or the lion's share of that time frame to properly prepare and implement change. So that's where the AADC uh, applies and fits in in terms of the regime. But let's just see what the A AADC brings and how long have we got? Now, I mentioned a moment ago there is an, um, uh, an implementation period. The AADC came into force on the 2nd of September, so that's just a few days ago. There is a 12-month grace period or a, an implementation period, so the ICO will look to start enforcing the AADC from September 2020. The ICO is currently preparing guidance 
focused on helping SMEs to adapt to the requirements of the AADC, but we are strongly suggesting that you shouldn't simply wait for what those requirements and guidance and, and so on is going to be from the ISO, but actually you do start to look at how this is going to impact on your organization and what this means for you. There's a lot that you can do to start looking at where the AADC applies to you. Now, the AADC, and it's worth just focusing on a few headline points at this stage, even though some of these are self-explanatory, it's worth making sure we are absolutely clear on this at the outset. The AADC is a statutory code, and it is a UK statutory code. It does not apply elsewhere outside of the UK. However, as the ICO itself points out, the intention and the desire and the framework that's provided here, part of the future direction of travel, not just in the UK, but also the EU and globally with regards to protecting children and kids' data online. The AADC applies to processing activities that are conducted by UK companies offering digital services, for example, websites, e-commerce platforms, and so on. Important to note, the AADC applies to also non-UK digital service providers that are processing the data of children in the UK. Now, think to yourself here, just because you may be based outside of the UK, you should be thinking that in terms of the extraterritorial impact that we've seen in play under the GDPR, you should think of the AADC in exactly the same way because it's under the same package of laws that we see the extraterritorial impact of GDPR, but we'll also potentially see the extraterritorial impact of the AADC. But do have that firmly in mind. Let's not think this is only for the UK. It falls under the UK regulation and regulatory regime, but of course it will have the potential for extraterritorial impact beyond it. So the AADC itself, I mentioned the, the fact that this falls under the Data Protection Act 2018. This was to fulfill the requirements that the Information Commissioner had to prepare codes of practice on specific types of data handling. Now, as a code in itself, it doesn't have standalone enforcement provisions, but the regulator will consider them when taking enforcement action under the DPA 18. Now, what's the courts are generally bound by guidance? Even from a regulator, it should be assumed that this is akin to an extension of the GDPR. So it's not worth brushing this aside simply because you think there's a technicality that allows you not to consider this as a piece of legislation. You should consider it with the same enforcement and interpretation that you see that GDPR will shine a light on, which it will do as far as the code itself is concerned here. The ADC sets out 15 standards for digital services which are likely to be accessed by children. That's really important. And we're gonna focus on that particular distinction in a moment as well. So anyone under the age of 18 counts as a child for the purposes of the AADC. So this is not by any means just for very young children or for very, very young children or a specific age group. There's quite a complex age bracket coverage here. And that's very specifically under the AADC as it's given power to under the GDPR. Why do I say it's complex? Well, let's take a closer look at the standards and the impact. And to do that, I will hand over to Joe Joyce, to walk us through that from the next slide. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Vin. Hello, everybody. Um, so as Vin says, I'm going to uh, quickly, because um, as, as clients, clients of ours who've been trained on this by me know, I could spend several days talking about the 15 standards of uh, and, and data protection principles applying here. So I'm going to quickly go through those before we start to look in a bit more detail about, about how to um, assess uh, what needs to be done within individual businesses and go about making those changes. So the first of our 15 standards, um, and really the most important one, um, is that uh, the actions um, that, that you take with the personal data of children have to always be in the best interest of the child. That's the overarching principle that applies, and, and kind of the other 14 standards really flow from that. 
Um, it sounds a little obvious, uh, of course, we act in the best interest of the child, but actually, when we're talking about businesses, um, we don't generally act to the detriment of our, of our customers or our consumers, um, but we're not always necessarily thinking about what's actually best for them. We're looking for something that is um, normally a, a sort of mutually beneficial arrangement, but when we're talking about the, the, the information of, of children, we have to take an extra step and actually think about are we, are we actually acting in their interest. The second of our, our 15 principles uh, is, is the standards, rather, is the importance of uh, undertaking data protection impact assessments. Many of you will be very familiar with the GPIA process. Um, these need to be uh, reflecting child-specific issues from now on. And in fact, the ICO has already produced quite a, quite a useful GPIA template, uh, which can help you to start um, thinking about how to make those assessments on child-specific issues. There um, has to be an age-appropriate application um, of, of how we use data. Um, this means that there really needs to be a, a risk-based approach to identifying the age of, of children. In some circumstances, it's going to be important to work out you know, the, quite precisely the age, the age brackets of, of users. Uh, in other, sometimes it, it will be inappropriate to gather additional personal data in order to uh, more closely work out the ages of users. So it's, it's a delicate balance to strike, and there's a lot of work to be done there for, for some people. Transparency is always a core uh, GDPR um, sort of fundamental value, and uh, it sits as our, our fourth uh, standard here. The sort of takeaways from this are always going to be that clear language and, um, in many cases, more visual techniques are essential to help children understand uh, privacy. Even very young children have a right to be informed about how their information will be used. Sometimes uh, it will be important to flag up the use of, of data to parents, but actually in many cases it's the children themselves to make some determination as to how their information is used and what level of monitoring they're comfortable with. So there are some thorny issues there, um, and Tamara will, uh, when talking about legal design a bit later, weigh in on, on some of the techniques and opportunities um, presented by legal design methods to, to help with that. Um, the, this standard is, is, is really against the detrimental use of data, and, and that sort of obviously flows, again, from the first standard, uh, the best interest of children. I mean, thinking about the well-being of, of, of uh, child data subjects before processing that data, um, and, and really sort of narrowing down on what is in their best interest. Flip through. Our sixth standard is around policies and community standards. Um, and it's really here, I think, the, the takeaway is about doing what you say you're going to do. If you tell children that you will be um, enforcing certain community standards on, a, on, say, on a site, if there is a lot of user-generated content, or if there is a sort of a social media aspect of what you're doing, it's very important that you're consistent and do what you say you're going to do. Uh, that applies sort of generally as well as with, with privacy-specific issues. And I think one of the, the things that will become apparent as businesses start going through and, and working out how to implement the, the AADC is that actually it, it doesn't um, it doesn't construe privacy narrowly. It, it really you have to be quite broad in your thinking about about children's rights and interests and privacy. So that will apply to, to all sorts of community standards as well as, as narrowly to privacy related ones. The seventh standard is around default settings. Um, the IT has been super clear on this um, and it's it's one of the easiest things to understand, uh, even if it's it's perhaps a challenge um, from a business perspective, is that privacy settings should always be set as high as possible as a default basis when you're dealing with children's data. The eighth standard is around data minimization. Again, uh, not an unusual uh, concept for those familiar with privacy and particularly with the GDPR, but it's particularly important with children's data to collect the minimum needed and to make sure they're given a choice around that. And again, as children uh, grow older and as you have a relationship with, with, with users or, or, or child customers over a longer period of time, what's appropriate in terms of the amount of data you might collect will change, and it's important to make sure you're refreshing those, those uh, consents and providing updated information. The ninth standard is around data sharing. Um, really, it's very important always to only disclose data where there's a compelling reason to do so with all data subjects. But uh, data sharing, when it comes to children's information, is particularly sensitive. And uh, so there's going to be quite a lot of uh, guidance, I suspect, from the ICO around when data sharing will be appropriate and how to reduce the exposure of children's data to that. Geolocation, uh, a little bit like uh, default settings, is one of those aspects which is quite straightforward in terms of the current guidance. Um, it should be set to off as a default, unless there's a strong reason to do otherwise. 
Now, obviously, some applications and services rely upon uh, geolocation uh, in order to, um, to work at all. In those cases, it will be about what's the minimum amount of data necessary for the service to work properly, and how do you communicate to children properly how that data is being collected and what it's being used for. Our 11th uh, standard is around parental controls. Um, a lot of people uh, think that, uh, or, or there is, a, in my view, a slightly mistaken belief that uh, privacy, uh, when it comes to children's data, is all about giving parents controls and access and information. Actually, one of the things that the, the AADC emphasizes, and one of the things that was quite clear in the consultation process the ICO undertook to write the code, is that actually children have rights even as against their parents in many cases. And particularly, they need to know when they're being monitored. Um, it's, 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 uh, it may be appropriate for parental controls to be in place for certain types of services, but it's not generally acceptable for those to be in place without children understanding when they're being watched. Uh, profiling is our 12th standard, um, and again, if there is uh, optional uh, profiling of users, it, that should be switched off by default, um, and even where it is necessary, it really should only be allowed with protective measures. Profiling and its sort of associated issues is, is a complex problem. Um, increasingly, profiling is essential to the effective operation of lots of services. But that doesn't necessarily mean collecting data just because it's available. Uh, 13, uh, our 13 standard is, is, is around nudge techniques and the use of those. Um, it's an interesting area and one, I think, which was um, the most controversial when it came to the consultation for the code because the ICO made it quite clear that they were looking uh, both at nudge techniques from the perspective of, of, of privacy and encouraging users to provide more data than is strictly necessary, but also they focused on things like screen breaks and, and the amount of screen time that children would be having, which is arguably outside of the, the core remit of, of, of what, what, they, what they're there to do. Um, but they do view these things as being interrelated, and therefore it's important that we're not using those techniques to weaken privacy protection. But it might be acceptable to introduce them to encourage children to uh, to revisit their privacy settings and perhaps to default them back to, to, to higher settings. Our 40 standard is around connected toys and devices. Um, this is obviously a, a growth area, and it's, it's really important that they come with the appropriate privacy tools to make sure that users can access um, their, their privacy rights appropriately when using those kinds of uh, tools and devices. And finally, online tools in general. Uh, the idea that privacy tools, so um, policies and notices, obviously, but also uh, information around how to access rights of, of, of erasure, of subject access rights, things like that, uh, need to be prominent and accessible. Um, and I think um, tomorrow we'll be talking certainly in a way that will we'll give, give some ideas around how accessibility might be promoted. It's also important to note that there are other um, requirements around accessibility. We have um, the European Accessibility Act, European Directive coming into force um, in, in, in those countries that are at that point still member states in a, in a few years' time, which will, will deal with um, accessibility in a broader sense. So there are lots of different overlapping requirements around digital accessibility as well as the code. And one of the challenges for many businesses will be working out how to comply with all of them um, in a way that is um, meaningful, but also doesn't become such a massive burden to business. So moving forward and talking a little bit about how to actually um, assess uh, the business and, up, and update what needs to be done. A quick reminder that the same categories of personal data will apply here. There's nothing new about or different about children's personal data. Information uh, relating to an identified or identifiable individual is personal data, and that means directly or indirectly. So you may not have somebody's name. You may, uh, you may have child users of a service whose names you don't have, but they have a user profile which directly relates to them. Information about their, their use of that service will be their personal data. And of course, the same uh, standards apply in terms of special category data, so that extra sensitive data. Um, and that will be information about health, sexuality, sexual behavior, political views, religious affiliations, ethnic origin. Trade union membership is unlikely for children, I will concede that point, um, but also biometrics. 
And obviously, a list like that, you think, well, why would we be collecting that information relating to children? But actually, if you're, say, for example, operating um, a service where it's possible to generate user-generated content, you're encouraging people to share information online. Actually, people quite often share information that falls into those categories. Um, it may not be particularly sensational or obvious. It may not feel particularly sensitive when you read it. But nonetheless, it, it falls into one of those categories. It needs to be treated with extra care. So the big question, how will you know which, which uh, services the AADC is going to apply to? Well, if you offer an online or connected service that children are likely to access, then you're going to fall under the yoke of the AADC. Now, that doesn't mean a service that's designed for children or even designed with them in mind. Um, and I think one of the most important things to consider here is that we're talking about individuals who are under the age of 18. Now, actually, quite a lot of 16 and 17-year-olds will be looking at all sorts of, of, of you know, websites that you would think of as being traditionally um, targeting adults, but that don't have sort of age gating or age restrictions on them. News websites, social media websites, um, e-commerce and retail websites, certainly. Uh, there is actually the difference between what a 17-year-old might want to look at and what a 22-year-old might want to look at is, is, is not so clear-cut and distinct. So you need to consider whether your, your service is likely to appeal to under 18 due to the subject matter or what it is you offer. And that might be because the service has a universal appeal, so anyone might want to be looking at it. You also might have some demographic evidence about your users. So if you know that a notable proportion of your users are teenagers, say 20% of them, then you're going to have to really consider that the code probably does apply to you. Obviously, in some cases, if you are producing content that is specifically with children in mind, then you're going to know that the code applies. But for those businesses, actually, I think it's often the case that, that they have less work to do in some respects because you've already been thinking about children and how they navigate your service and, and how, how to make it appeal to them. So in many respects, it might be slightly easier to get into their mindset from a privacy, privacy perspective there. And uh, I'm wondering if somebody else can flip forward a slide for me because my mine seems to have frozen. Perhaps one of the other speakers would kindly move forward for me. Uh, apologies, everyone. Very slight technical hitch. We'll still work out what's going on there. Oh, right, and I think we seem to be back. Sorry, everybody, I don't know what happened there. I think it was probably a slight connectivity glitch at my end. Right, moving then on, are we still not sure? Well, it's quite tricky, admittedly, and I think until we have a lot more guidance and probably uh, some ICO decisions on this point, it's always going to be tricky to be certain whether or not uh, any given service falls into the category of being likely to be accessed by children. So if we're not sure, then I, I, my current advice would have to be to err on the side of caution. If you think it's possible that older teenagers will use your service, then you should assume the AADC applies. If you decide that the AADC does not apply, then that's absolutely fine. Make a note of that. Explain why as part of your good record keeping for the purposes of GDPR generally. But I would recommend reassessing that on, on a, probably an annual basis at least. And certainly take into account any new user demographic data or other information that you get in about your user base as appropriate. Um, and obviously, I would hope, uh, do make sure that if you're gathering user demographic data, trying to find out more about your user base to see if the AADC applies, please make sure you're doing so in a privacy compliant way. So very quickly then, before I pass over to Tamara, I'm going to just talk about key themes um, that we are 
we're already seeing and we're already noticing. The ICO have pointed out some very specific points, which are, in, I, I think, probably the, the easiest um, to appreciate within the code, those issues around setting privacy uh, to, to default stages, um, making sure it's always set as high as possible, uh, and avoiding those sticky and nudge techniques to try not to do anything to encourage uh, children to share data uh, any more than is necessary with, with either you or third parties. Um, the ICO has identified different stages of development, um, which have been mentioned briefly. And depending on which age bracket you think your users will fall into, there are different uh, needs and expectations for them, um, depending on which uh, developmental stage they fall into. Some require um, much more uh, parental involvement um, or approval. Uh, some won't need that, but will need a lot more um, explanation. Uh, one of the things that we always say um, around privacy notices written for children is that really, unless you have a very complex business um, in which you know, very confusing data flows are, are moving around, uh, if it's any form of consumer business or anything sort of customer focusing, then really all of your privacy information should be written in such a way that a relatively intelligent 14-year-old can understand it. Um, and it's certainly going to be important in the future that older children can understand privacy notices and settings without having to ask an adult. And don't forget, uh, privacy isn't just about you and the user. And I mentioned this a little earlier, and I'm going to repeat it again. Because I think there is a risk um, for some organizations that they rush to um, push parental involvement as a way of reducing their risk under the code. And actually, they may find out that that backfires, because children are entitled to privacy in general, not just from you and from other service users, but also potentially um, from parents as well. Parental involvement and support can obviously be very important, particularly for younger children. But it's really important to remember that children um, need to be able to access online services to um, access certain types of information without their parents knowing. In some cases, this might be crucial for children who have concerns around identity, sexuality, or who are experiencing abuse in the home, and where there, is, there are forums in which um, information can be shared, particularly on social media type platforms. But think about this quite broadly. Um, it's important that children uh, understand if there's a risk that they're going to be monitored by someone. Um, so it's important to think carefully about parental safeguards and when they're appropriate, and make sure that children know if they're being monitored or recorded. So with that, um, we're going to talk finally, as we move towards the end of this, into um, how actually to prepare and some of those points around design and default that Jim mentioned earlier. At the first stage, of course, it's important to actually assess what's going on and work out whether the code applies and to what extent. Um, we do recommend considering each of the 15 standards in turn just to see how the service measures up. Obviously, in some cases, it's going to be important to undertake a, a data privacy impact assessment as part of that process. You may already have uh, DPAs in, in place for services that could be updated or refreshed, but uh, do take a look at the, the ICO's guidance on this point and how those, those um, assessments can focus on the interests of children. And don't forget to work through the user journey to see every angle. This is something that uh, Tamara talks about at length when she talks about um, legal design, and with good reason, because unless you actually put yourself in the mindset of the user, how they're going to react and behave around um, privacy prompts uh, and defaults is, is hard to determine. So test it from a privacy perspective with real children, if you can manage that. Um, obviously, that's not always easy to do. Um, but the more sort of real testing you can get um, from, from those in the kind of the appropriate age group of your user base, the better. Uh, at that point, then, it's going to be important to, to address those, those areas where you think that there's some work to be done and to put a, place in, a plan into place to address them. Um, and of course, we only have 12 months to go, so what's going to be key is prioritizing. Um, we suggest, although every business and organization is different, um, but our recommendation would be to focus on those high risk issues first, then consider those issues that require third party uh, involvement, so vendor, uh, vendors or data processors that you're working with, just because anything when you're dealing with a third party adds some time to the, uh, the proceedings. And then finally, uh, to think about those public facing issues as well uh, and try and make sure that privacy notices, settings, the things that are going to be apparent to users are, are, are dealt with and prepared um, well in advance of that uh, 12 month period running out next September. And then finally, um, when you have worked out which standards um, are going to apply, it's really important then to um, build uh, privacy into the product service planning and development process. So as and when changes are being made, 
uh, to existing services or as you're planning something new, make sure that you're putting privacy and child privacy at the heart of it from the beginning because reverse engineering privacy in is always difficult and it doesn't work as well. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Tamara, who's going to talk a little bit about legal design in particular and how we recommend uh, implementing that uh, in order to really make the most of, uh, of, of the design default process. Thanks very much, Joe. So you've heard now quite a lot about the AADC and a few mentions of legal design, and you might be thinking, that's all very interesting, but how do we go about implementing it? And that is where legal design can come in. So you might be familiar with it already, or it might be a new concept to you, but legal design is a movement to make law more accessible, usable, and engaging. So it's building blocks for really technical expertise, plain language, and functional visuals. So it's a human-centered approach to legal problem solving, and our focus here will, of course, be children from zero to 18 and really sort of getting into their heads and thinking about their best interests. It's about improving their experience by applying design thinking principles to our legal drafting and to our compliance with the code. Um, so you might be thinking maybe it's just about making things like privacy policies or agreements prettier, but it's not so much about the aesthetic, aesthetics, it's about the functionality and effectiveness of getting this information across to children. It's also potentially a great opportunity to keep legal compliance aligned with your brand. So to give you a brief practical idea about what this might look like, it could look like headings to facilitate skimming, it might be things like themed color coding to signal different parts of a document, or multi-column layouts with different levels of explanations, or even comic contracts, and you might be doing some of that already. So, why should we use legal design? So in law, we're often dealing with content that's inherent, inherently a little difficult and complex. The AADC obviously has 15 interconnecting provisions which we need to take into account. And we can't sort of change or reduce the difficulty inherent in some of that, but we can change the way that we present information to people. We can use plain language and useful visual structures to help people, in this case particularly children, to better remember and understand the things that we need to communicate to them or to ask them to agree to. So legal design can help avoid misunderstandings and maybe disputes, it can help you to demonstrate compliance, in particular with consumer and privacy requirements like the AAD. And in fact, the GDPR suggests providing privacy information in combination with standardized machine-readable icons in order to give an easily visible, intelligible, meaningful overview of the processing. You might also be wondering if this is actually useful in practice, and it is. There is a growing body of qualitative and quantitative research evaluating its benefits. So as some brief examples, a series of small studies conducted by the Behavioural Insights team under DBEIS in the UK showed that if you add a summary, for example, of key terms with icons to a web page, it increased people's understanding by 34%. Adding a just-in-time explanation of how a website used customers' data increased understanding of the privacy policy by 9%. For example, they start using a new feature, you have a little supplement that reminds them of exactly what's happening, they can link through to the full policy, that helps people know what's going on. You might also think about using uh, comics, illustrations, or speech bubbles, um, and researchers said that that can increase understanding by about 24%. So even telling people just how long it might take to read something can actually double opening rates. Um, for example, if you want someone to actually read your privacy policy, which I'm sure we all do, all of these things can help get that information across. So how can we apply this to the AADC in practice? Um, first, as Joe mentioned, we always think about our users first. Um, and here we're going to think about, are they really young children? Are they teenagers? Is it a range of different sort of age ranges? Um, what is their parents' involvement likely to be? What is their media literacy level likely to be? Maybe what potential harms or risks are we trying to avoid? And we can use all of those answers to those questions to help really drive your approach to compliance with the AADC. And you might also consider if you can run any workshops to co-design or test designs with children, and Joe mentioned this as well. Wherever possible, it is great to get feedback directly from the people that we're trying to provide information to. So as an example, in practice, you might apply this to privacy notices, which is, this is an obvious example. Um, for example, once you know the age ranges of the children using your service, you might decide, we think we need two versions of our privacy policy, one for young children and one for parents. Um, you can also make sure you use clear, simple language and build on existing design features and icons. 
they'll be familiar with already. So there's no point reinventing the wheel. There are some icons we all know and recognize. That's great. We can use them and hopefully it'll be easier for people to navigate that information. Um, you can also consider incorporating things like the web content accessibility guidelines or think about including audio, visual or hard copy alternatives which take into account different children's access needs. So again, if we think about who's likely to be using the service, how might they want to access this information, that can help us think, well, actually, maybe we're going to also do a supplementary video that explains our privacy policy, or at least sort of highlights from it. You might even provide something like a one-page comic that explains key points to kids. You might also consider something like a privacy setting center. So a 2016 study by Stanford University showed that people are much more likely to engage with a dashboard of choices and policy terms rather than just a privacy policy document. Um, so you might consider something like a child privacy center, which includes maybe visuals like slider to show different settings, perhaps diagrams of who data is shared with or who can access data. And it can help children understand the information in a way they might not if it's a wall of text. You could also include things like visual tags to indicate that if things like location tracking or parental monitoring are on or off. You might think about maybe having a sort of friendly, consistent character that provides bite-sized explanations or warnings if settings are changed. So there's a lot of different options, um, and this kind of just scratches the surface, but ultimately legal design can be a really valuable part of your compliance toolbox when preparing for the AADC. And I will now hand you back over to Vin. Thank you very much for running through that, Tamara. Um, we have some questions. Um, I think we will try and get to those questions in a moment. Um, but before I do that, having walked you through uh, how the AADC fits into the scheme of data protection law and GDPR, and having walked through the standards and how you'll need to look to address AADC and, and giving a further flavor of that, uh, through tomorrow's slides on, on legal design in particular. We thought we'd just test again how you think this is going to impact on your business. So the first question I'd just like to pose to you by way of polling is, can your business achieve compliance within 12 months? And I talked to the beginning about the ICO's desire to make sure it allowed time for businesses to comply. So I'd love to know your views. Yes, you think it's achievable. Um, but you will need a clear program of change, or perhaps at this stage you're still unsure of that. So hopefully you've been clicking away, and yes, okay. So, uh, well, that's pleasing to know uh, that there's some 75% of you think, yes, 12 months is achievable, uh, but we'll need a clear program of change. And I think that's our reaction and the basis of how we are discussing this with clients at the moment who are perhaps, as we see the early adopters are trying to look at AADC uh, and, and, and see how the change is going to be assessed and implemented. And it's quite clear that that change will need a program behind it to make sure that you can genuinely make the assessments that you need to make as we've been discussing in the webinar today. But still some 25% of you uh, who are unsure of that at this stage. And let's see if there's any further light that we can shed on this. I think another part of it that we often see, and it's not just about age-appropriate design code, but about any program of change, uh, is, is to make sure your key stakeholders are fully aware of, of, of what the change is. And so the question here that I'd like to poll is, are your key stakeholders in your business already aware of the code? So yes, if they've been fully engaged already, uh, and we know some of you have been, uh, we've worked with some of you already on how uh, you've been taking part in the consultation uh, stages, et cetera. Uh, or the middle answer, if you're partially aware, but, but or if stakeholders are partially aware, but perhaps more engagement and awareness is required. Or C, if we were to have it expressed that way, the third option, if you're not. Sure. So let's see how that looks. Okay. So interesting to see that just shy of 20%, so 18.8% there. So yes, they have been fully engaged. Um, and that's that's good to know at that stage. It's a healthy, uh, albeit smaller proportion. But there's still some nearly 
where there is more engagement and awareness that is required. Um, and and for, for, for the C option, not so sure, 12.5%. So imagine you'll be going back uh, with, 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 your, with your stakeholder engagement hat on uh, and seeing how you could provide more awareness to your key stakeholders. And hopefully this webinar has helped you in that process. We, we polled at the beginning um, around, do you think the AADC will apply to your business? And we wanted to just gauge your views on that again um, and see what this little experiment yields. Does it show that the results change or does it show that with what we presented to you and hopefully we've done a good job of doing that, but has that helped you understand or understand differently as to how or whether the AADC will apply to your business. So I'd be interested to in see uh, and invite you to click again. So yes, if you think it's highly likely to apply, or if from what you've heard, you're not sure, um, or for those of you who either previously thought or now think, um, there's a low chance that it applies and maybe you still need to know more or you still need to digest what you've seen today. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I think previously we had a very high percentage, it was around 70%, 7-0, that said yes, it was highly likely to apply. So it's interesting to see that's nudged up a full 10 points to over 80% now, uh, nearly 82% there. Uh, we had uh, about 12% of you who, who were not sure, um, that's fallen quite significantly down to four and a half percent, and probably very little movement uh, in the third option around there's a low chance that it applies. That was, I think, just shy of 15%, and it's not too far away from that at 13.6. So it seems that the swing, if I was to refer to it that way, is perhaps more towards greater proportion of those of you who have tapped away think that, yes, it is highly likely to apply, and hopefully, the, the, the presentation that we've given you today has helped you come to that conclusion and help clarify some of that thinking with you. Um, just to mention, um, and we have had some questions, so in a moment I'll just hand over to Jo and see if she's looked at some of those questions and, and, and whether we can uh, um, provide you with any initial thoughts on those. Um, I just wanted to add an extra viewpoint in here as well, which is, Right at the beginning, we talked about the fact that this is, a, in effect, a UK piece of law or regulation, or it flows from that. Uh, so I also mentioned, and the ICO alludes to this as well, that there may well be a direction of travel across Europe or globally where we start to see more around uh, other countries adopting laws or regulations in this area specifically or more broadly. And we've been talking to our colleagues uh, across our European office, and the two examples that perhaps jump out most to us in our internal knowledge conversations uh, in our international privacy team are Germany and France in particular. Uh, Germany um, has a, a set of draft laws at this stage, which are not specifically uh, running in parallel with what we've described around the AADC, but they do um, more than touch on some of the themes that we've talked about today, particularly with regards to regulating uh, media um, and, and looking further at regulation around content providers. Um, and there are some more specific examples in there around video sharing platforms and host providers uh, and so on. And there is a possibility or a likelihood that we're going to see some um, uh, a finalization of those draft laws or that process coming to an end uh, by the end of this year, so within the next sort of three months or so. Um, and just to give you, again, just a little flavor of that, what we're talking about is laws here that look really around content um, and are looking around the obligations for service providers, for example, to take comprehensive measures with regards to issues such as age-appropriate reporting systems for their users, or, or establishing a rating system for, for user-generated uh, content, whether that's audiovisual or otherwise, uh, and particularly looking at that from the context of 
differentiating the appropriateness of the content and therefore being able to assess the consumer of that content against the age appropriateness. Also looking at technical means and establishing the technical means within that, within that legislation around issues such as age verification and again particularly around user generated content um, and also the, the introduction of tools in areas such as parental control. Now it's interesting we're also seeing talk within that draft legislation around the, the creation of a federal central office for child and youth media protection. So you can see where this is coming from. It's very much a protection, a very much a child and youth protection um, that whilst it is focused on uh, content and content distribution and user generated content and so on, um, it's quite clear that many of those themes will touch along the, uh, uh, the, the, the aspect of AADC that we've been talking about today. So it's not quite GDPR, it's not quite AADC, but there is a heavy influence of age appropriate content relating to media consumption. That was Germany. In France, we are aware that the CANIL conducted a public consultation on the processing of children's personal data. And in that context, it was children aged 15 and under, and particularly in, rel in relation to, to web-based services or information society services. We haven't seen the output of, of, of that study yet, that hasn't been made public yet. Um, the CANIA, we understand, is expected to publish those guidelines and recommendations that are likely to focus on issues such as the legal capacity of a minor uh, in, in order to be able to access some of those internet-based services uh, and what that means in terms of their capacity to do so on their own or with a legal guardian's consent. So again, we're looking at this concept of age and age gating and capacity. Um, looking at the establishment of a system for checking the age of users uh, and how consent would tie into that. So again, re-strengthening that, that issue around age verification. Um, and also looking at how, how, how minors, as it's referred to uh, in, under the French uh, studies here, have rights or can, ex uh, can exercise their rights over their, their data. So what we're seeing here is, is, is maybe more of a focus than we've seen from the German perspective and the German developments, the more focus on the French developments around the link between access to content, availability of services, use of those services online, and the age of a child and verification and consent and rights over data, which is perhaps a much stronger association with what we've been talking about today. So as we see more movements across the EU, and certainly outside of that, um, we, we, and, and as we see some of the countries engage with the issues of children's data uh, and consumption of services, and we do expect to see more movements, uh, we will make sure we update you. Before we wrap up, and before I wrap up, uh, I'm just gonna see if, Joe, uh, you've managed to see if there are any questions um, and and whether or not we have any views on some of those questions. Thank you very much, Finn. Uh, we do have some questions. We have some excellent questions. And uh, I'm going to, uh, if you'll forgive me, go through them quite quickly, just so that um, everyone who's asked a question uh, has at least uh, some steer or direction. But there may be some further issues that you want to know about. And I think, we, I think I'm right in saying, Vin, that we can encourage people to drop us a line if they want to know more. Is that, is that fair? Absolutely. Excellent. Okay, so I shall quickly power through then, and obviously if you and tomorrow have anything to add uh, to my whiff, whiff, wafflings, then please jump in. So first of all, uh, Lynn McIntosh has asked uh, if we anticipate a problem with the UK defining um, children as 13 or younger for the purposes of the GDPR, um, but at, at 18 um, in, in relation to the ADC. Um, I think what, what that, um, the issue that that throws up to me is it's not so much a problem um, in terms of definition or is it a legal problem it is a slightly confusing issue though because i think um the, the site risk you run there is is, is that um 
uh, individuals who are familiar with the GDPR and know that the age uh, for digital, digital consent to information society services, so the ability of children to consent to um, engage in, in certain online activities, set at 13 um, in the UK, which is actually a, a, a derogation from the GDPR, which sets it at 16 as standard, but permits member states to go as low as 13. We know, for example, in France, it's set at 15. So those who, individuals who know that that's what the, the GDPR says might find it somewhat confusing that this new code um, says that we need to start giving special consideration to users under 18. I think the important thing here is to just put yourself in the mindset that, that actually the AADC isn't about consenting to receive those services. So um, it, it, it may well be the case that you need parental consent to sign up to um, an application um, or, or, or a service if you are under 13. But actually, the AADC is around um, protecting users and their privacy in a much broader sense. So it's around making sure that the transparency issues are achieved. It's around making sure um, that they understand what information is being collected. But that, so it, it covers everything as opposed to just that consent point. So I don't think it's a difficulty as such, but it certainly is a slight communications issue that I, the ICO is working very hard to address. And, and obviously, so are we at the moment. Um, Yvonne Buswell has asked around cookies, a question about cookies. Um, as, a, as a financial services provider, the website is not designed for children to use, but some children might be looking up how to use an account, um, not knowing the range of, of, of age of users, but assuming that they have consent to, um, the ability to consent to cookies, and are there any recommendations? Um, I think it's one of those interesting areas, and actually financial services um, is, is an area where I think very little work has probably been done historically into thinking about children's data. Some providers may have specific microsites for their, for their child users, for you know, children opening bank accounts. Um, but actually, I suspect that there's an increasing uh, proportion of, of, of teenagers with bank accounts who are interested in um, having apps to track their spending and engaging in, in, in kind of financial services, um, you know, at sort of a younger age, which is, you know, broadly speaking, probably a good thing and to be encouraged. But it is going to be important that some work is done in there to make sure that actually they can understand what it is they're looking for. When it comes to just browsing sites and, and, and looking at cookies, well, there's not much to worry about there, and that's not really going to be, um, it, it does fall within the AEDC, and obviously it is important that privacy notices are clear and understandable. I would probably go back to the point I made earlier that where you, where you aren't expecting very young users and where you're clearly not targeting them, nonetheless, where you're doing anything that's focused on consumers, it's a good idea to have privacy policies and cookie, cookie notices that could be read by a relatively you know, bright teenager. I would, I would say 14. I think if a clever 14-year-old can understand this, then it's pretty much good for anyone. Um, and that would be by general guidance around cookie notices. They actually, you know, so teenagers absolutely can consent to, um, to, to cookies being dropped, but they do need the, a clear and, and um, properly put um, notice so that they understand what's happening and they're clear on their rights. Uh, Sarah Arvison asked if uh, we could direct um, everyone to some AADC resources that are geared to product and engineering teams specifically. I'm afraid not quite yet, Sarah, um, I fear, but I am hopeful that the ICA will produce some information that does think particularly around um, how those who are developing uh, digital products and services should think about it. And I say that with some degree of comfort because there's been quite recent guidance put out um, around the use of artificial intelligence, um, which is very heavily focused on design teams as well as on legal teams. So I think there is a, a real push uh, to uh, sort of honour the commitment to privacy by design and default by making information available to those who are actually doing the designing. So um, nothing on that front from the regulator yet, but I, I expect there will be some good information and we'll certainly be talking about all the new guidance that comes out with RE alerts and updates um, as, it, as and when it is. And I will chat to Vin and maybe he will, he will let us write a particular guidance note or uh, an article for our Global Data Hub that addresses those points because I think it's a very important issue and it's, it's crucial that people who aren't lawyers have uh, the, the tools they need to put this into practice. Uh, very quickly, and I know we're, we're short on time, um, and Vin will shut me up if, if he has to, of course. Um, but just moving on to a, a query from Guy Wheeler about the use of geolocation services. Um, you, it, it, some services, um, as, as in Guy's case, use uh, geolocation in order to comply with local laws around data residency, um, or to supply uh, legal terms in local languages. And how does that work with the new restrictions? That's a really good question. 
uh, the code, uh, the AEDC, is, is quite clear that it's, it's not going to be the case that geolocation is banned or forbidden, or that for all services it should be switched off as a default. If there's a good reason that it's needed, um, then, then that's absolutely fine if, it, if it's an issue of complying with specific legislation or to make sure that privacy notices are available in the right languages, that's, you know, then that's fine. But it's about setting the level of geolocation. So you may need to know which country somebody is in. You probably don't need to know what street they're in. So it's making sure that you've calibrated it correctly and also that privacy notices are quite clear about what information is being collected as a, as a default. And obviously, if you are dropping cookies in order to allow your geolocation to work, then that should be made really clear in the, in the privacy notice up front. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm going to turn to a question we have from Natalie Griffiths. If an organization specifically doesn't want to collect children's data or process it because the content is, is clearly aimed at adults, such as a campaigning organization, are there any specific tips? Um, well, it's quite tricky absent um, actually putting sort of geo-blocking in and, and sort of quite complex age verification processes, which, which obviously require the collecting of extra personal data um, to, 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 to make that work. When it comes to um, organizations which are, if you're operating just a website, well, if the subject matter is not likely to appeal to children, then your risk is reduced. If actually you're collecting, um, so say through online forms, you're collecting information about p possible um, participants or people who might be interested in the organization, then you can obviously state that it's, 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 it's not for children and, and um, you're only looking for information of those users who are um, over the age of 18. Um, there's a limit to how far you're expected to go to discourage children from participating. If, if obviously what you say in your terms doesn't match the, the nature of the site and the way in which it's designed, if it's clearly designed to appeal to young people, then simply saying we don't want your personal data probably isn't going to cut it. But actually if there's no obvious appeal to, um, to, to, to teenagers or younger children from the site, um, then simply saying, look, this, you know, please only provide your information if you're over 18 is in most cases going to be a perfectly adequate way of dealing with that issue. Um, but if and when there is further guidance on that and, and any of these issues, we will absolutely um, be, be sharing it um, through our mailing updates. I think that is all the questions we have, which is good because um, I've gone, uh, gone on for precisely one minute longer uh, than our intended runtime. Um, so I will pass back to Vin just to uh, summarize and, and, and finish up, I think. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I, I think the one point I just wanted to mention in summary, and this links to, to the, uh, some of the questions and a theme in some of the questions and the answers you provided around age in particular. And I think there's a very interesting piece that the ICO has included within the guidance uh, uh, and the code, I beg your pardon, which is that information around the age and developmental stages uh, of, of a child. And the, the reason I say that is because quite a lot of work was done when I was part of a, a body that put in um, a, a reasonable amount of consultation and work with the ICO uh, over the decade ago around the, the link between the age of a child, the maturity of a child to understand uh, what is happening with their data and, and also how complex or simple the use and collection and purpose of that data is and there is a an interesting balance across all of those themes and it's interesting because the ICO has retained a lot of that uh, albeit under the context of trying to understand the developmental ability of a child to understand what is happening with their data um, and still having in mind the stage of development and maturity uh, and the complexity of, of, of the data processing and that links to so many points here uh, and whether it's trying to understand the application and how far and how extensive uh, the AADC applies, uh, and also the output, in other words, the change that you need to implement to address the level of complexity of data processing uh, and, and use of that data, and against the bracket of age that the child uh, uh, you, uh, that you know is using your site or services. So there's an interesting piece, and I would encourage you to look at it if you haven't done uh, within the AADC itself. So we have run over by just a couple of minutes, but it's important that we uh, captured your questions and answers.
Um, if you have more questions and answers, stay tuned. Um, if you don't already receive our Global Data Hub uh, news updates and thought leadership, let us know. We'll make sure you do. Uh, or you can uh, uh, access that on the Global Data Hub, which is teloisten.com forward slash Global Data Hub, as you see it on the slide now. Um, I don't think this is the last that we'll be presenting on this subject. The moment we know, know more, the moment we hear more, in particular around the ICO's proposed efforts to engage with business on this and provide more guidance, then we will bring that to you as that happens. Our next webinar uh, is likely to focus on data transfers again. We think there's much more still to explore, um, particularly under SHREMS 2, but also as uh, the Brexit deadline looms in whichever way it looms. Uh, but there is, there is an important issue there still to be looked at. So our next webinar is likely to focus on that. Again, stay tuned and you'll receive our updates on that. But for now, from the team here today, this is Joe, from Tamara, and from myself in Banj, thank you very much for joining today and goodbye.